Um, test. A little test. Test. Sure. For this uh, assignment function and that you get all the library requires that you and some of them lower. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, then random pick first up randomly that function find out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you can so if you kind of have an idea of where the minimal lie, you could take two different intervals. Say, OK, it's going to be roughly there and roughly there. Right. right. And it only has to be roughly correct. Right. That's the kind of the. Yeah. But you still the interval to find a Which, yeah, which is lower than exactly. Option. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it is that quite. Is. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite possible to pick the wrong one and okay. it's a that I don't know if there's a minimum here. And in that case it's still a board. Yeah. So you have to find that initial bracketing. That's no, that's the art part. <laughs> For this assignment, yeah. Because it, it the assignment is really about learning to use a library. Um, if you wanted to make this more robust, you'd have to you'd probably code in, but Whatever happens with root finding and, and minimization is there's always a part of, of a little bit of art or a little bit of a little bit of knowing where the solution roughly lies before you can proceed. There's no you can have brute force ways, but you'd still have to know you could step through your function and sort of sample, right? And then kind of see where is it. But even then you have to know what's a reasonable sample size and how far should I go. So even so you can make things a little bit more robust by doing that, but it's still always a bit ad hoc. There's no there's no real way around it.
Trying to think if there's anything that we should announce, but I don't think I'm fine. The one? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's All right. Linear algebra, linear algebra, the ease. We can post the the updated itinerary. <laughs> and then I forgot what we are doing first, random or ODEs, but it doesn't really matter. See what we have right now because we have something on there. Oh, that's what it's doing. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to go in. See where we had one. I don't think we were that specific. No. Yeah. Oh, this is where I had it. I think it I had it in the in the first. One, Let's see if I have that somewhere. I think I had a, yeah. Okay, so the, that's good. And let's change that a little bit. Not too, not too much. Yeah. Great. Thought it was a. So we're, we're going to get started. Um, thanks for those of you who have uh, filled out the poll. Uh, that gave us a chance to review how, how we're going to spend our time, especially concerning linear algebra. Uh, most of you are familiar with some of them, but it sounds like you'd like a refresher. And so we're happy to oblige. So this was the original outline that we have here for this part. Uh, the first uh, two, like the 9 and 10, which we had two, two weeks ago, uh, we're still on track. We're going to switch around the rest a little bit. So this lecture is going to be about fitting and Fourier transforms. So that used to be lecture 15. And then we're going to start on Thursday with a sort of a, a refresher of linear algebra, sort of touch upon all the little things that are useful to know, especially if you're using linear algebra in a numerical context. So that's going to be Thursday, um, so lecture 12. And then we'll have a lecture. 13 will be the second part of that, which we'll talk about how to use this in, uh, in a numerical context, how to use a library for your linear algebra, which ones are good. Um, 
And then uh, the, the third lecture in the series of linear algebra will be the application of it, which, is, which will be partial differential equations, so how to solve those, uh, because that's where you, uh, you typically need linear algebra. This is why we bother with linear algebra, or one of the reasons we bother with linear algebra in this numerical course, because it analyzes a lot of the solvers for partial differential equations. Then in the last uh, two lectures of this session, we'll get back to uh, ordinary differential equations and molecular dynamics, and we'll add a, a, uh, a lecture on random numbers, which we sort of omitted from the first lecture. So that's going to be our, our track for, and then the file I.O. will leave for, uh, for the third part of this course. It kind of has to do with uh, performance anyway, and so the third part was supposed to be about high performance computing. It kind of fits in there quite well, too. Okay, so today then, we're going to talk about Fourier transforms and fitting. Um, they are kind of related. It's good to know how to do both of them. And so uh, we bunched them together since, uh, since we're going to use libraries and you've been struggling a little bit with uh, the GSL and root finding, et cetera. Uh, your struggle is, is the same every time and therefore less every time. Once you've used one library, and especially a, a bit of a verbose one as, as a GSL, other libraries are going to go, oh, this is the same thing. Uh, so this effort isn't, isn't in vain, even if you're never going to use root finding. It's the same uh, again and again. So today we're going to talk about fitting, about uh, how you would fit to do frequency analysis, and that will lead us into Fourier transforms. So fitting first, I have data. I want to find a law that governs that data. That's a pretty common science. And so unless you have two or three points, you're going to do this numerically, even if it's not a big data set. And if it's a small data set, you're probably going to do it in some sort of nice GUI package. But if you wanted that as part of a bigger program, uh, you would do that with a library. And so how are we going to do this numerically? So first things first, let's get some data. And um, I just put this on here to show how I am going to generate data. And uh, I won't go in detail, but uh, this uses some of the nice built-in things in C++11, like random numbers. They're right in there. As I said, we're going to come back to random numbers towards the end of this, this section, uh, but not today. Uh, but you can have things like Gaussian distributed, uh, well-behaved random number generators. And here, the idea really is to create two arrays x0 and x1 that have one is equally spaced. We've done this in our very first exercise, if you remember that, equally spaced numbers. And then something that the second uh, one depends linearly on that first number and has a bit of Gaussian noise. So we're just pretending to generate data rather than actually collect it of something that has a linear relationship between one another, uh, but there's some, some measurement noise. We've added it in, in here by hand. And we're doing that, of course, because that way we could check if our, uh, if our uh, fitting result is, is or fitting procedures doing the right thing by seeing if we get the right values for the coefficients A and B. Um, so this is, a, this is just gener generating the data, and this little section here prints it out to screen. So now I'm going to fit that. So suppose I have that same generate, da generate data function. You can generate the data again here. Uh, and now, Fitting is in the GSL too. Almost anything is in the GSLs, which is kind of nice. Not everything is as fast as it can be, but uh, for a uh, linear fit like this, you're fine. So GSL slash GSL underscore fit dot H will have fitting procedures like linear fits. And so we're going to fit this to a linear model. We pass in both the, the first column of the data and the second column of the data. Um, it's a very generic uh, or, or general um, fitting procedure. So you could have this be, in this case, I, it's sort of column by column. I could have done it row by row, uh, and I can give strides to make sure that all the points are right. But in this case, there's nothing, every, every next point comes after one another. That's what this one means. The size of the data is extent. And then there's these variables. C0 and C1, as you might expect, are the coefficients in your li linear relationship, and the other ones are the covariances and the uh, residuals of the sum of squares. Uh, so this gives you the fit 
anything else to you know, compile and link, of course. Um, and then once you have that fit, once you have these two numbers, you can actually uh, use the GSL again to make predictions. So I'm going to go over uh, all of these points again and make the predictions. So I put the predictions into uh, X1. Oh, sorry, in Y. So X1 is the data, and Y is the prediction. But the nice thing is, if I keep all these co this covariant uh, information, that same function can give, a, give me an estimate of the error. Right? What's the likelihood that this is actually uh, the, the right value? So if I do that, and I print that out, and I use my favorite plotting program, I would get something like this. So the, the black dots, or the dots, um, are the data, so there's a little bit of a noise along a straight line, and then this is the fit. But the fit came with error bars. So we'll have outliers, that's fine, um, but this is, this is what it gave. Okay. Quite simple. We already have the GSL installed. Um, it's, using, it's using least squares, obviously. Um, most of you are physicists and have had at least something uh, like that. Yeah? It can. In this case, it just gives the error bars back. So if you, if you look at the code, I'm not giving any errors for the data. But there are variations of this that can, can do that. So, um, so we, what did we do? We had data, x, y, or it's called x0 and x1 in this case. We had some sort of model, in this case, a linear model, where we say, OK, there's going to be some noise. Assume that there's some noise. We don't know exactly what it is. Uh, if it's normally distributed, that's sort of the model of, of, of the data. We maximize the likelihood by taking the sum of squares. So we take each data point minus its uh, fitted value, this f, and we square that. But the fitted value depends on the parameters. And then we minimize this, uh, the sum of, of these uh, residuals. And that gives us our a, a, b value. Make sense? So this is called ordinary least squares, because it's the simplest thing you can do. And you're, you're making the squares, these squares, as least as possible. But you can generalize this. Uh, you could have errors in your y variable. You could have errors in your x variable. Um, and you can estimate, and they, they will become some sort of weight. If you have a large error in a point, you don't want it to, to change the, uh, the result much. There's a function for that in the GSL. Uh, you can have several a's and x's, so you can have several uh, independent variables, and therefore more coefficients. Uh, you can have forms that aren't linear necessarily, but they're linear in the parameters, so a, b, c. Uh, so you could have polynomial fits. Uh, be a little bit careful with polynomial fits, because it's like if you take a if you take a high enough high enough order of your polynomial, um, you can fit any data. It just doesn't mean anything, right? Like it, it wiggles around your data, but it has extra wiggles in between just to make it to the next point. Uh, none of that is particularly useful. Uh, so you want to have your models sort of reflect uh, what you think might happen, not just some random number, some random uh, uh, function. Uh, even if you have a nonlinear fit or nonlinear parameters, you can still try to minimize these squares. But the nice thing about this one, and we'll see that in the next slide, is that uh, you could solve for these uh, coefficients a and b. You could do this minimization exactly. Whereas if it's not a linear uh, form in your coefficients, you, you cannot. You'd have to solve it. You solve it numerically. And so since we're doing numerics, we could do that. Uh, but it becomes a different kind of problem. Uh, and so one of the things that least squares is not very good at is uh, getting rid of really far outliers. So we just had a couple of somewhat outliers, but they weren't bad. But if I had an actual measurement, measurement mistake, and I had a point right here in the, the lower right corner that had no, obviously no, uh, no bearing on anything, it was wrong, uh, least squares would be highly affected by it. Uh, whereas other cost functions might say, well, if it's very far, uh, just don't consider it at all. And so this you can do by doing different cost functions. So our cost function was this RSS here. You can have other cost functions that are a little bit more robust against that kind of stuff. Yeah. So just to show what happens behind the scenes. And again, we don't have to code this because it's already in a library. But it's good to know why linear models are special. Uh, so suppose we have a general linear, linear model. So here, fj could be just linear functions, just x. Uh, they could be uh, 
polynomials or the monomials of a polynomial, and the beta j would be the coefficients. Uh, what we want to minimize is this sum of squares. So y is our actual data. This is the prediction depending on the betas, and we want to minimize that. So um, when you minimize that, it depends on what these functions are, right? What these base func basis functions essentially are uh, at each of the data points. So we can take these together, f, j, x, i, and view them as a matrix. And that makes sense because it actually turns out that if you want to minimize this, what you have to solve is f transpose, so f as a matrix times f, acting on the, the vector beta, so beta can be seen as a vector, uh, has to be equal to f transpose of your data y. Okay, so you have to solve this. This is an equation that's of the form Ax equals b. A is a, a is a matrix, x is a vector, b is another vector. We have to solve it for x, or in this case, beta. So that puts us in the realm of linear algebra. We're going to see next third sort of recapping uh, linear algebra. Uh, but this is one of the main things you're going to do in linear algebra. So behind the scenes, the GSL is using linear algebra for this. Now suppose that rather than having a linear fit, we had some signal. Maybe it's a gravitational wave signal, and we wanted to know the frequencies in that. Um, well, one thing I could do, knowing all about fitting now, is to say, well, if it's a frequency, it goes like a sine. So I just make all my basis functions sine the different omegas of different frequencies, and then solve for beta, and then I know the amplitude of the different frequencies that are in there. So we could do that. We could give these different basis functions to our, uh, our d squares fitter and start chucking along and, and try computing this. Uh, now, the trouble is, if you get this a little bit wrong, these are oscillating quantities. A little bit wrong gives us lots of, lots of oscillations. And so uh, this is not, there's a better way to do this when we're looking at frequency analysis. So, and that, that is the discrete Fourier transform. So who, who here has never heard about a Fourier transform? Be honest. OK. So we know a Fourier transform. But I'm going to go over it very, very quickly. Um, gonna, because we want to get to a fast way to computing this, which will be the, exactly the improvement over just using fitting procedures that I just talked about. And there will be a library. OK, so very quickly, because we all know this, suppose I had a function like this, this nice little cusp function. Um, of x, so there's a variable function of x. I can transform this. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use complex uh, form because it's the easiest to, to, to denote. Um, and it gets something that kind of looks the same. What happens is that we have a function that depends on x. x could be position, and we get uh, wave numbers. x could be time, then this would be frequencies. And the nice thing about this transform is you can invert it uh, exactly and easily uh, by essentially switching the sign in the exponent here. But that's if my x can vary continuously, and so can my k, um, and I have an infinite, an infinite stretch, an infinite interval. And that's never going to happen in the numerical world. It rarely happens in the real world, but definitely doesn't happen in the numerical world. We'll have a finite number of points where our signal is sampled. Right? In any case, the nice thing about the Fourier transform is that you can take any function, express it in a Fourier series. Um, and this is really yet another way of doing a, a, a basis transformation. We'll look more at, at basis next, uh, next lecture. But you can go backwards, back and forth between, uh, say, a time domain and a frequency domain or a spatial domain, a wave number domain. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, essentially because some parts of your problem might be easier to solve in a frequency domain than in, a, uh, than in the real domain, especially if they have uh, a partial or just a differential operator in um, So. It's not hard to figure out that this x of i k x is an eigenfunction of the ddx operator. What does that mean? It means if I take the heat equation here, or the diffusion equation, the u dt equals alpha, uh, and then the Laplacian acting on u, 
after Fourier transforming, so its Fourier transform you had satisfy an equation that doesn't have any, any derivatives at the right hand side anymore. So I'm turning partial differential equations into ordinary differential equations, and that helps in solving them. So this equation is much easier to solve in the frequency domain or in the wave number dom domain than in the spatial domain. Sometimes you have a mix, and many simulations go back and forth between the part that is easily solved in the time in the in the spatial domain and in the frequency in the wave number domain. Uh, what's hard here are localized uh, operations. They are easier here. Things that happen at this time, right, right at this point. So periodic phenomena, spectral processing. Virtually anything with a Laplacian is, is, is nice to do with a Fourier transform. If you can't go back and forth quickly, there's no point in doing it at all. If it costs you too much to go into this Fourier space, then you might as well do the hard problem in the original space. So suppose we have a simulation. We have a grid of the atmosphere, for instance. Atmosphere doesn't work very well because it's curved and, and it goes around the sphere, but let's say we have a a flat atmosphere, flat Earth, also very popular these days. Um, in, a, in a simulation, we most likely have the value of any quantity, say the temperature, on a grid. Not everywhere, because we can't have infinitely many points. And the simplest way we could have that is on a regular grid. Every kilometer, we will measure the temperature, and we have a grid of temperature values. So rather than having a continuous function f, we'd have sample values f. J. Now, it just turns out, uh, and Gauss already knew that back in the day, um, that you can do the same thing as a Fourier transform with sums rather than integrals. So you take the same kind of e to the i k x, except you have indices j and k here. Um, so those are whole numbers. And you can transform with a sum in the same sort of way to an f hat of k. So these are the transforms, the Fourier transforms. You get as many points out as you put in, uh, at least if, if they're generally complex numbers. You can transform back again by switching the sign. You just have to be careful with the normalization, which is why there's one over the number of points. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so the Fourier transform gives you the coefficients of the Fourier series. Yes. And if you're on a regular grid, there's only certain uh, frequencies of wave, wave numbers that fit. So that's why you get a discrete uh, k as well. So any, anytime you put something on a grid, stuff starts to become discrete. So the number of uh, the, the frequencies become discrete. So you can back transform. Now, there's a few funny things that happen here. And we'll see, we'll see them in action uh, in the example. But um, first of all, the solution is periodic. These are all periodic functions, right? So whereas our continuous Fourier transform could have time go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and this could or could could be a periodic function, but didn't have to be. Here, uh, because I only have a finite number of grid points going from, well, if you're programming C plus plus zero to n minus one, um, these are periodic functions, so it kind of automatically continues and pretends like the nth point is the same as the zero point. It doesn't matter that there is no nth point, there is no extra point. That's kind of how it would look if you would extrapolate using this function. And you see that back in the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform will be such that if you try to compute the negative frequencies, you'd find that they have to be equal to the frequencies at n minus k, so all the way in the, in the back of your sample. Negative frequencies become the same as very high frequencies. It's because you have a grid. You can actually not distinguish a signal that is a very high frequency or just slowly going back. It's kind of funny, but that's how it is. And in a similar, uh, similar sort of um, spirit, there, there's a limit to the number of frequencies you can even uh, represent in this, in this way. So if you have a frequency that's higher than, than your grid space, so it goes up and down in one grid point, you can't distinguish that from a constant signal. Right? Because in every grid point, it went back and forth. So there's a maximum frequency, n over 2, beyond which you can't really say if it's that frequency or something higher. So funny things happen if you discretize uh, that you have to be aware of if, if you really work in this space. Um, okay. 
So let's do a slope transform first. Um, how would I go back and forth? How would I implement this, this fairly simple procedure, right? F hat k is just a sum over all my samples with this complex uh, phase vector. Here it is. It's actually very simple to program in, especially uh, using the complex number that's already in C++. Uh, just for, uh, so this is doing a slow Fourier transform. Shouldn't have an F here because FFT is usually fast Fourier transform. But um, so I'm giving it an array of uh, of points, and I want to get out an array of F hats, and I'm I'm using the old uh, pointers for that. In this, this this is an example from last year when we weren't using R arrays yet. So, um, but basically, it's doing it in two loops for every k. I'm going to find the sum that I have to compute. The complex, the co this gives me the, uh, the resolution of the e to the i vector. And this is just straightforwardly taking that formula, computing it. This gets you back and forth. Um, by using this bool argument, I can go back by making that true. It will give you the inverse. Okay, so you get inverse or not. Um, so you can go back and forth very easily between these two. But it does take a lot of computations. If you, comp if you see uh, a sample of size n, since there's a double loop, will require of the order of n squared uh, uh, computations. And then each, time st and each step, I have to compute these cosines and these sines, which are uh, fairly costly. So even uh, the guy that came up with the discrete Fourier transform realized that this is no way to do this. Uh, and he wasn't dealing with a lot of points, but he did have to do them by hand. So he had a lot to gain by, by speeding this up. And he came up with a fast Fourier transform. Now, people forgot about this fast Fourier transform. Uh, so even though it was known how to do it, it was written down somewhere. That's what I should say it was in notes. People didn't notice this was available until uh, Uli and Chucky re, uh, reinvented or rediscovered this in 1965. So here's the basic idea. And we'll show it in, in, in uh, formulas in a second, too. Uh, imagine you have your Fourier transform. You have your endpoints. And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to, instead of computing n squared for that, I'm just going to cut them in half and do Fourier transforms of each half. Um, that is faster because it's now n over 2 squared. But that's not fast enough either, so I'm going to divide it up further um, and do that. But how many times do we have to divide it up? Well, that's 2 log times, right? Uh, 2 log n times. So that's how many times I divide up until I get one point. And the Fourier transform of one point is itself. So that's easy. OK. So the only thing I have to do is combine everything back together in the right way. Now, I don't have to divide it in two necessarily. I can divide it in three, et cetera. But that two is easier, and computers like powers of two. So usually you take powers of two for n. So this gives you, once, once you do it, instead of n squared, computations n log n. Now, n log n still goes up, right? It's faster than n. It's not linear in n. My sample is twice as big. It takes more than twice as long to Fourier transform. So if that doesn't um, impress you too much, here's some simple numbers. So fairly modest sample sizes, like a sample of 8,000 points is nothing, right? That's, you know, that's a blip in your song. So. Here's the ratio of the n squared over the n log uh, n to log n. And so even for 32 samples, this fast Fourier transform is six times faster. You get something like 8,000 points, you're 600 times faster. This matters, right? This makes it possible to do the things that are easy in Fourier, transform, uh, Fourier space, in Fourier space, because you don't have to wait 600 times longer to just get there and then do that simple operation and wait another 600 times longer to get back. You wouldn't do that. This makes this possible. So just since I, I would want to know it, how is this done? Um, so here's the split up, essentially. So just for notational uh, purposes, we define this basis smallest non-one phase vector. It's all phase vectors in there, right? Um, so we can use that these are all kind of related. So in the, in the Fourier transform, and that essentially, we're just taking the power of these complex phase vectors. Uh, we rewrite them a little bit. So we take the even samples and the odd samples. And both of them look like a Fourier transform with an extra phase vector in front. So this is how we split up 
one Fourier transform in two of them with a little phase vector. So, but it's even an odd samples that we have to do for that. You have some time, go through this slowly if you want, if you're interested, but that's, that's. So the next step, we're gonna take the even ones of the even ones and the odd ones of the even ones, and the even ones of the odd ones and the odd ones of the odd ones. So everything sort of gets shuffled around. We take the, the even ones, we shuffle them together, and the odd ones, we take the even ones, so everything gets hustled. And so there's a fair amount of actual, almost card shuffling involved to get back from doing all of this division to the actual number we want. Now, shuffling isn't a big and a costly operation, right? You're not actually computing anything. So uh, although you have to do that bookkeeping, it pays off to do it because in the end, after uh, two log n uh, levels of this, you're already done, right? All you have to do is undo the shuffling and do this computation of this phase vector. Okay, so that's the n. So you don't want to program that in yourself. You could. Uh, you probably won't do it the fastest way. And it's been done, been done uh, several times before. It's really tricky, especially the shuffling part, to get all the pieces right. Even if you understand the principle of it, getting everything done for arbitrary n, tricky. But in addition, to get this done well on specific computer architecture, how you do the shuffling matters. Because it matters when you're shuffling anything around in memory, whether this is memory that is far away or close to your processor, all of those things matter. And so those details, you really don't want to think about. Sure. OK, so what I did here, I took this equation. First, I take out all the even samples. So rather than summing from 0 to n minus 1, I go from 0 to n over 2 minus 1. And I take, uh, so these are, these are the even even so I have the even samples here. See that? So I'm only summing over even. Here I'm only summing over odd ones. And because they're even, I can use this identity that omega n over two is omega squared. So that's that's kind of what I went here. So what I sh should have is two j in here, but I, I replace it by n over two. Okay. And similarly here. So this this looks just like the first Fourier transform of the even samples because it has the same k over j. The sample size is different, so n minus n over 2 is different. But other than that, it's the same one. And so I wouldn't get that if I just take half. Because if I just take half, I just get, um, I, I don't get this same form. So to get the same form, I need to take the every second one. And same with the odd ones. And the odd ones just give me the phase. But I have to do that at every step. So if you imagine, if I had, say, eight numbers, these guys are treated different from these guys. Right? But then in the next step, so I take those, all the x's together, and all the, all the minus together. But in the next step, these guys are different from that here too. And so I'm taking together these and these. Now I have to put them back in some sort of way, where this one has to find its way back to was this one, was this one. You get an idea of the shuffling that I have. So I have to basically get the indices right. I took things together, I have to unpack them again to put them in the right spot, and do this extra phase. That's the shuffling that is. That's because, because at the end of the day, once I've done this, this one I can do in one, one computation. OK, so this is one. So I have, in the, I have two log n levels. And I only have to do of order n computations. And that makes it faster, rather than doing this whole matrix multiplication that is n squared. So it's all for fast passes. So there is a couple of libraries available for you to use. Um, the one that you'll be using is, the, is called FFTW, in particular version 3. Don't use version 2. It's, it's old. There's no need, to use, no need to use an old version. And it's... So fast Fourier transform. And it stands for the fastest Fourier transform in the West. There are other ones. There's the MKL made by Intel and the ESSL. These are numerical libraries that have uh, typically more in them than just 
Fourier transforms. Um, you can imagine that on Intel architecture, Intel MKL is probably better tuned than on IBM uh, machines. Uh, this one might be better tuned. That's true in general, uh, but these are not free. So if you're a big client and you buy a big Intel machine or a big IBM machine, you might get them for free, but you would have to pay for them. Uh, there is ways to get this guy for free for personal use, but um, again, we're using the totally free FFTW. Because, they're, because these guys have uh, you know, eight people behind them, they tend to be a little bit better, but this, the, the basic scaling, this n log n thing, is, is already present in FFTW, and FFTW is pretty, pretty decent. Uh, sometimes outperforms the other ones as well. Okay, so we're using libraries not to have to do the shuffling, not to have to know how to do this well, uh, how to uh, how to not overload the memory uh, subsystem of your like you don't want to know about these things. Right? You know, do a fast Fourier transform, use a library. Uh, GSL has one too. Um, it's a bit, a bit on the slow side, so we just go to what people tend to use, which is FFTW. So here's the same. Uh, fast Fourier transform, but now fast. Um, you don't see why it is fast. That's why I went through the explanation to show you there's math behind it. This is why it's fast. Um, and it, it, tend, it tends to go in, in three steps. You create a plan, or you have FFCW, you create a plan, you give it your arrays, uh, you tell it whether you go forward or backward, and, um, and then to estimate the best way to do that. Then you execute the plan, and then you destroy the plan. You do this because FFT, the one way to get this speed is to take your problem, say, OK, it's of this size. This size fits well in within the memory, or it's of a big size. It doesn't fit. I have to chop it up in pieces. What it has to do depends on the size of your problem. And that's why you have FFTW plan this ahead of time, and then execute it and destroy it. You can save these plans. So if you're doing fast Fourier transforms, again and again, again and again and again. If you have a time stepping, you can save your plans. Uh, so FFTW doesn't have to figure out, doesn't have to waste any cycles figuring out what the fastest way is. Um, you can even have FFTW do little tests. OK, your problem is 8 by 8. What's, I have 10 ways of doing this. Let me try them all and see which one is fastest and pick that for all the future ones. You only do that in, in real production. Uh, typically, you stick with estimate because uh, having it measure it takes time. So if you do it once, there seems to be no reason to do it in three parts. But if you do it more than once, save these plans. It's not as bad as, the, as, as some of the GSL stuff. Um, but this plan thing is, is sort of funny. Okay. The inverse is the same. I already mentioned that. Uh, I should mention that this, this factor of 1 over n in front Almost all implementations leave it out, which means if you transfer forward and backward, uh, you don't get the same signal. You get a signal times n. It's up to you to, to put that n back in. Uh, you can see why. It's easier to just switch the sign and not worry about this. There's also different conventions uh, of, of what you define as the forward and backwards. You could have them both have a 1 over square root n, uh, which you could do, but you always have to compute the square root when, you, when you're doing this. Um, there's, way, there's even uh, definitions where you take the 1 over n in the forward one. So not to worry about any of these conventions, that, that, that gets thrown out by most of them. Okay. So I'm going to, one of the last things we're going to be doing is look at, look at our specific example um, to see some of the funny things that happen when you discretize a signal and how to get around it. Uh, so. I'm going to use a sync function, so that's sine over x, sine x over x. And I'm going to take uh, 16,384 points, which is a power of 2, on an interval of minus 30 to 30. So I'll show you how it looks, but it basically, uh, if you know the sync function, it goes like that, up, down. Uh, this is large enough to get most of the tail. Okay. I'm going to perform a forward transform, uh, compile, link, and then I'm going to compare it with what the Supposed outcome is. So if this is a non discretized form, its Fourier transform is, is a rectangle. Uh, and rectangle is, in this case means it's a half uh, between minus one and one, and it's zero outside of it. So it looks like a little bump. And so up to the normalization, which is this one over n effect. So we're going to 
and not be too concerned about that. We want to see if this matches. So it's a good test, especially if you're just starting a library or any code to have a test case, but you know, you know what has to come out, right? Start testing. Even if it's not your library, don't just trust it. See if it does what you expect. Um, it will also teach you a little bit better how to use it. How to use it. So this gets a teensy bit um, messy. But that's just because I put everything on one slide. Uh, and I have to apologize for using statically allocated arrays. It was my way of um, fitting this on a slide. I would not advocate this. But suppose that here are 16,000 something uh, samples. They go in Fn. And F hat will contain the Fourier transform. Um, I, take, I take this format to, to get an x range from minus 30 to 30. You can imagine 0, that gets negative 30, and n becomes 30. And then if, if x isn't 0, I just compute sine x over x to get the sync function. And otherwise, I use that the limit is 1. So computers aren't very good at dividing 0 by 0 and giving me 1, but this is the actual limit. So the real function has OK. So that's just my generate data. Now, I generate a plan here for a 1D digital Fourier transform. Um, I, get, I pass it f. And I've had it doesn't do anything yet. It just sees, OK, these are my, uh, my arrays. They're of size n. I want to do a forward one, and I just want to estimate what is the, the best way to do it. I don't actually want to measure it. I execute it, and I destroy it. By the way, this, uh, this little FFTW complex star thing is because um, the type that FFTW expects is FFTW underscore complex, um, which under the hood is precisely the same as the complex structure of C++. It's guaranteed to be so. Um, but the two aren't seen by the compiler as the same type. So we have to tell this, well, this is a pointer to a complex number, this is a SCD complex number, but just pretend like it's an FFTW complex number. So we're kind of we're cheating a little bit. FFTW should really just say, let's use the complex numbers that are in C++. But because it's a C program, can't really, or C library at, at heart, it can't really do that. So this, is, this is our way of going. That's all that is. It's a detail. That's how we pass our arrays. We execute it. So this plan has saved what arrays it has to uh, act upon. So that's why this works. And I destroy it because I'm only doing this once here. Um, the plan might, might allocate some extra helper arrays. And so uh, it's good to destroy it. And I print out both the function and its, and its complex value. Now I'm going to cheat. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You can. Yeah. So you could. So you could have an. You could. And there's even allocation uh, routines within FFTW uh, that might be slightly beneficial over just doing this because they will be aligned properly in memory. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's there's uh, restrictions in different. So you can make a plan that is transportable from one to another, but then you have to. So you keep the same size, but there's different arrays. Sort of reinitialize a plan, saying, okay, but now the pointers are this and this. Uh, yes, you can. Um, so yeah, those are there. It's, uh... Okay. So what was I? Yes. So we've got the, 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 uh, the function itself, or the samples, and then it's Fourier transform. Right. So I'm going to cheat a little bit, uh, mostly because there's no good standard way to do graphics from, uh, from C++. It's not that there are none. There's no good standard that is cross-platform, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but I want to plot these because I know what they should look like, and plotting is the easiest way to check. So I'm going to switch to Python. Who here is not familiar at all with Python? It's an easy language. You'll probably, I'm really just plotting the stuff, so don't, don't worry too much about, about that. So first, I'm compiling it. Here we go, G++. I even forgot the C++11 here, because I'm not really using any of the features. Linking it. And here's my linking. So I have to install the FFTW library. 
make sure you get version 3. Uh, if you do that, if you do it in standard location, this will happen. If it's not a standard location, the same thing that we see with the GSL, use a dash capital I and dash capital L to get things to work. Um, now I'm running this, and there's a, a tiny bit of detail here where uh, complex numbers, when you output them in, in, uh, in C++, uh, they get braces around, or uh, uh, parentheses around them, so uh, real value, comma, complex uh, imaginary value, and then these braces. And those, those parentheses trip up uh, stuff when I read it in as data in Python, so I strip them out. That's all that this tr tr -d does. It strips out my parentheses, and so I'm taking the output and put it in a, a file that doesn't have parentheses. So output from that has a first column of the real values of the signal, then the Im imaginary part of the signal, which should be zero because I haven't set it, and then the real part of the Fourier transform and the complex part, or the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. So in Python, or particularly in IPython, that comes with a whole bunch of goodies in PyLab, um, I can read this data with this gen from text function. Here's my file number, and everything is now delimited by commas, so that's what that means. It's in data now. Now this is just basically a two-dimensional array, a column that, uh, that has these columns, and I can ask it to plot the data in the first column. That's this guy. So that's the real part of my sync functions, and that looks like a sync function. The only difference is that the x values make no sense because these are samples just numbered from 0 being the first sample and 16,384 um, as the last. So my x coordinate is kind of gone uh, and has been replaced by an index. Then in a separate figure, I want to plot the Fourier transform. And it gives me this. Right? Do we remember what was supposed to come out as a Fourier transform? It's a rectangle, right? Does this look like a rectangle? Ask my, my five-year-old that, and they will say no. So no, right? It looks like an H. There's a line here, too. Um, what, what's going on? Like, this makes no sense. But our, like, is our library broken? Did we not install it properly? Um, and so it turns out this is exactly what you should expect. And I'll tell you why. So first off, um, should have had a plot of no, I have a plot of the plot. Notice that where is it? That this rectangle function needs negative k values, right? It's centered around zero. What I've just plotted goes from zero to sixteen three hundred eighty four again, right? But I've told you that this is a periodic function. You can't see this as anything else but a periodic function. So the negative k values are actually wrapped around, and that's, that's what these guys are. So with a little bit of Python trickery, I can convert my, my data into something that wraps around. So this is going from essentially from something very close to 1684 to, uh, to the end, and then from 0 to some reasonable number. And I've zoomed in a little bit. So I've only taken, I think, about 30 points or so. So I've glued it back together. I've taken my negative parts, which were all the way buried at the very high frequencies, and made them into negative frequencies again. So this looks a little bit more reasonable, because at least everything is sort of centered around 0. But it's still not a rectangle, right? The rectangle should just go up the 1 half up to a normalization. Because the rectangle, so the rectangle should look like this. So if I have my k axis here, and here is 0, it'll look like that. Right? So from minus 1 half to 1 half. But barring some normalization, what I get is something that starts at 0. So the best I can expect is for this to be 0. And then at the very maximum, so whatever k max this is, it would go up again and would look kind of like that. And this is actually, there's a lot of values here. So what we're seeing with this sort of H is these guys squeezed together. And so by putting this back here, I can actually see what's going on. OK, so again, there's kind of a shuffling going on. But this, this is just due to the fact that this has to be a periodic function. And so it starts naturally from 0, but I could have just said, well, I could have 
written it out differently, knowing what is negative and what is positive. From the discrete point of view, there's no difference between these high frequencies and the negative frequencies. They're equivalent. There's one thing left here, though. So is that clear? I've wrapped them together. Now I've got sort of the real view. But it's still all this oscillation is going on. So it kind of looks OK. But every second point is, is, is negative from the, from the previous one. So I have, I have sort of a rectangle with a phase vector. Like it's the fastest phase vector that I can have. See that? If, the, if these points, these negative points, were positive, they probably look just fine. And just to make that point clear, if I, uh, if I explicitly put in phase vectors of 1 and minus 1 uh, alternating, then I get exactly the rectangle. So what's going on here is that not only do I have this wrapping around going on, but my, my function didn't, it wasn't centered around 0, right? So I really have shifted my whole function. When I shift a function, I get a phase vector. So in a Fourier transform, a shifted function gives you a phase vector. So I've kind of shifted my whole, and it wasn't this function, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Um, so the, the function that I shifted is my original function. So here's my sine, right? The true sine has its zero in the peak. Our zero is over here. We've shifted it by half the length of, this, of the interval. And half the length, the phase vector of half the length, actually turns out to be exactly minus 1. So two things happen. Our from uh, 0 to 16 and 3084, instead of minus 8,000 to plus 8,000, that gives us the phase vector. And our frequencies are periodic, which means that half of my signal ends up where I expect it, and the other half ends up at the other very end. As long as I know that this happens, I can make sense of the, of the results again. If I wanted them to map back to the correct values, I have to undo these artificial things. So I have to kind of, another way to do it is to keep track of what the x values are. But because we just have indices, and that's all that the Fourier transform acts on, this happens. So this, these are good things to know. Does that make sense? Okay. So on the fast Fourier transform, then, I always create a plan. Uh, contains all the information. Uh, you can measure or you can estimate, but measure takes a long time. Um, another thing that is good to know, it works with doubles by default. Uh, we're going to stick with that. But there's a way to make it work with single precision as well. So. And then finally, a few, a few more notes about special cases. If you have real data, as we had, turns out that translates into a symmetry for your Fourier transform. And you can exploit that by storing less numbers. So if I have real data, I don't have to store the imaginary part of my signal. Right? So I should be able to just give it real data. But then I still get a complex value back because it's a complex Fourier transform. Using this symmetry, I could basically throw out half of those and say, well, I already know they're the complex uh, uh, conjugates of the original ones. So when you look at real Fourier transforms, Fourier transforms of, of real data, and they will use a compacted, a compacted form of their, of their data. Um, there's different ways to do that, but this is the symmetry that it is based on. And one of them is called health of complex storage, and there's, there's just different ways. I don't want to go into the details, but um, if you have real data and you can't afford to double the size of the data and just work with it as complex data, um, these, these are details you'll have to figure out. Uh, how it is gone, how it is done. Um, okay. A multi dimensional don't need much time because they're the same, except you work on a larger grid. Same kind of stuff, same kind of uh, negative frequencies are equal to high frequencies happens. It's a little harder to visualize, perhaps, but if you want to transform like a, a picture and just you know, blur it by just taking the lowest Fourier transforms, you can do that. Um, and those, of course, are in, in the FFTW. Um, let, let the library do this. I think that's, uh, that's, that's the uh, moral of the story. Questions? OK. See you on Thursday.
started.